Jim Norton is not a doctor. He's not an expert. He's not even a good person. The views, opinions, advice, and humor of Jim Norton does not reflect those of any doctor, of Sirius XM, of OB Radio, or anyone else. They are solely those of Jim Norton, Lyle Chipperson, Edgar Mellencamp, Paul Hargis, and whoever else lives in that chinless head of his. If any of this advice goes wrong, you are the asshole who called a comedian instead of a doctor. An icon in comedy, a fighter for freedoms, an accomplished entertainer, and a pervert. You've got problems, he's got problems. You've got questions, he's got answers, some of which are good. Call now, 866-WOW-1WOW. That's 866-969-1969. This This is The Jim Norton Show. Well, hello. Hope the volume is good. Lou and I did not do a volume check before. We kind of just take for granted that it's going to be good. So, um, I guess I got a couple of uh, calls already. I've been doing this thing because, you know, I've been bitching about my arm being messed up. My right arm, I've got some tendonitis and I haven't been able to lift in months. And I occasionally ice it, but I always forget to, which I know is very good for it. But one of my trainers recommended this thing called DMSO, which is like a roll-on deodorant that you put on the afflicted area. And when you put it on, it itches for a little while. And it's some kind of an anti-inflammatory. And it's itching me right now because I put it on. But it is helping. I've um, been using it probably for about two weeks. And my arm is slowly improving. And again, I ice it after about... I'd say if I work out four times a week, I ice it twice. So I, if anyone knows what the DMSO is, I don't really know what it is. And that's, yeah, but it was a trainer who recommended it, and it actually helps. But the itching, I don't know exactly if, what that is. Uh, let's see here. Bryce in Dallas. What's up, Bryce? Hey, Jim. Uh, hey, your man. good buddy uh, Joe Rogan kind of came out and talked about how he takes um, testosterone injections. And you guys are about the same age. And I know you've been doing the chirotherapy. I was wondering if you'd ever consider doing like testosterone shots. Cryotherapy, I only did three times and I stopped. I want to ask Joe about that because, again, the benefits, I think, with uh, anti-inflammation and with skin are supposed to be good. But I read very mixed reviews. So I actually wanted to call him and, and, and get like a real take on it from him because I have not had a chance to do that. Oh. And testosterone, Rogan's an athlete, dude. He's a fighter. I don't know if I need it. Like... I think you have to keep taking it, like if you or you have to work out a certain amount. I, again, I don't know enough about it, but I've thought about it. Like, would it help my my erections? Would it help me be more whatever? You know, I, I just didn't know. Well, people think it's mostly just sexual, but mm-hmm. um, what I've, I've read a lot about it, and it really has a lot to do with just your energy during the day, the energy when you wake up, and it has a lot to do with like your recovery after workouts and just your overall mood. And those are things I hear you complain a lot on the radio. So I don't know, it might yeah. be. Might be worth uh, checking out for you. Well, I think my sleep apnea is a big problem. Um, I, I have a, I had my testosterone tested when I went for my routine blood work recently, and she said it was a normal level. It did oh. not have low testosterone. I was very worried about that. So I don't know, dude. I, again, I would ask Joe what he thinks. I would get an opinion because he does it. But um, you know, again, Rogan may have different needs than me because he's like a you know a gorilla bodied athlete, and I'm just a, I'm I'm more of a svelte twink model type. Is Joe Rogan cool in real life? Is he a nice guy? No, I can't stand him. Um, no, of course he is. He's a great guy. He's, uh, you know, he's a very real guy. Like Joe has a, a pretty brutal honesty about him and uncomfortable honesty, which is why I like him because if he, if he likes you and he spends time with you, you know it's genuine and he's not doing it because he wants anything. You know, he's a very genuine person. So, yeah, I like Joe a lot. Yeah, you're really, you're really good on his podcast, though. I really love when you go on there. I, I love doing it. I think, he's a, I think he's a great fucking broadcaster, and I really mean that. I think he's the best announcer in sports, too. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I love Joe. All right, man. Appreciate it. All right, pal. Take care. Uh, <clears throat> let's see here. Um, uh, a guy, Mike in Kansas, got married a month ago, and you got a girl on the side. Uh-oh. What's up, buddy? Hey. Um, hey, Jim. Hi, buddy. Here's my problem, man. Um, like, I, I, I love the girl I'm with. Love more in life. Okay. She's got everything going for her. She's made my life better. But there's still like this girl in the past. 
and she does all the dirty stuff, the ATM, the, the I mean, everything. Sure. You know what I mean? I do. And I don't want the new girl, the new girl will do it, but I don't want her to. And it's causing a rift. Yes. The big, the, the big thing, the Madonna whore complex, every guy because, has it. You want it like, because for me, <clears throat> I've always separated sex and love. So there were girls that I was loving with and I wanted to hold and kiss and that was my fantasy girl. That was the girl who was special, who I wanted to play certain songs for, who I wanted to share my real life with. And then there was the girl who wouldn't wear deodorant and she'd piss on me. That was the fun girl. And I loved the other girl and I really liked the dirty girl. But to me, they could never cross. They could never mix and I could never find the same person to be both of those things. And when I did find it, I got very addicted to that person. So if you have a girl willing to do these things, what is it about hanging on to the other girl that you like? It's, it's not about hanging on. It's about her becoming the thing that I go, oh, she does. I don't know. It's me. I know it's me, first of all. But it's about the fact that she... I don't want her to become that. I think in my eyes, she needs to stay like this certain way, even though I know that's not what she wants. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I lose interest after it's done. Um, yeah, because it's just a purely sexual thing. And when, when sex and love are not combined, like you said, I lose interest too. And I look at sex as a bunch of things on a checklist. And then when I, I accomplish them or I do them, a that lot of times, I, yeah. th that person, I need, I need to move on. How do I continue to look at them as a real person? Um, that's the key. For me, it always starts off sexually. For any relationship that's worked, um, I have to start off with a pure lust. And if that can develop into love, then I have a shot at a relationship. Because to me, the sex or the dirty stuff is the most important part. And a lot of times, I like the chase. So I fall for a girl the more she makes me chase her um, or the more tortured I feel by her. It's a very weird games I play with myself and none of it is truly, uh, uh, you know, it, an honest way to be. But I would say get rid of the side because the side pussy is what's going to fuck you up more than a wife who does fun stuff because you're going to get caught or the guilt you feel from cheating is eventually going to make you be a shitty husband or she's going to start to resent you because you're not doing stuff she wants to do. Right. And see, that's, that's exactly, Jim, this is why I called, man. You, you, you know, you take time thinking and you put it in perspective by hearing someone else say it. Well, sir, I've destroyed every relationship I've ever had. So I only, I, here's how I, I am standing up from the wreckage of my personal life to tell you what I did wrong. <laughs> well, we all, I, I, we all do the same crazy stuff, dude. It's really, I, it's I, all it is, you know? I appreciate you. And I, I mean, the thrill of the hunt is always going to be there, I guess. Sure, it's I just don't want to ruin the one that I'm with by... You know, so thank you, Jim. Man. Well, you know I what, dude? Before, th thank you, buddy. But before you go, you know, the thrill of the hunt is a big one. And one thing you can do, because my girlfriend and I used to, one of my girlfriends and I used to talk about cuckolding a lot. And we both knew that was a big step to take. Like, did I want, I, and I, I never wound up watching her fuck anybody else. But if you want to, like, the way to do that, like, to keep the thrill of the hunt going is we would put ads out. And she would talk to guys on the phone while I fucked her or while I went down on her. And that would be kind of humiliating for me. I would feel it in my pit of my stomach. And it would satisfy that need a little bit without actually doing it. So sometimes there are ways to do it without actually going all the way through with it and doing it. You know what I mean? There's ways yeah, to keep yeah, yeah. the hunt going with the person you're with. Okay? Yeah. Hey, right. Jim, man. Love you, man. Thanks for everything you do. And uh, comedy's great. And love the fucking show, man. All right, buddy. Thanks so much. All right. Bye. Uh, Seth in Colorado. What's up, Seth? Have a DMSO comment. Yeah, I certainly do. Uh, so how are you doing, Jimmy? All right. I got the DMSO right here. Uh, it says, keep out of reach of children. May be unsafe, not approved for human use. You're putting some fucked up shit on. Well, you know, it, it's it, it's an anti-inflammatory, and again, I, I, you're right, I should have read up about it, but I'm only rubbing a little bit on my right arm at a time. It's not like I'm coating my whole body in it. Um, yeah, it, it's like a salve. You only need a little bit, and I bet you have a, a, a taste of garlic in the back of your throat. Yes, I do. You're, that's exactly it. Yes. This stuff is not approved for human use. I'll, I mean, I'll even tell my wife right now, hey, honey, the asshole Jim Norton's putting DMSO on his body. 
Yeah, she's giving me dirty looks. But hold on, let me let me. Say, well, she probably didn't like the uh, the dirty word you used to describe such a fine fellow as myself. Oh, but just because it's not approved for human use, is it? You know, that could be an FDA thing. Is it going to fuck me up? It will. Um, skin irritation. Avoid contact with eyes, skin, clothing. Wash thoroughly after handling. I mean, it is not a human. It's diethyl sulfide. Sulfoxide. Right. I'll look. You know what, dude? I'll look into it. I appreciate you telling me that because um, <clears throat> that really did uh, the taste of garlic in the back of my throat. I appreciate that. I mean, they've had worse taste in my mouth, believe me. But uh, oh, I'm sure. I will look that up. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Have a good one. Bye bye. Okay. <laughs> Uh, John says, talk to Dr. Steve. Do not take DMSO. They use it on horses, not for humans. Okay, so maybe I will get rid of it, um, or maybe I will just use it. Uh, Brad in Mississippi has a DMSO recommendation. What's up, Brad? Well, it's not necessarily a recommendation, but DMSO is the active ingredient in WD-40. Uh, it's used in WD-40 because it's a universal solvent. It, uh, it's what makes WD-40 penetrate into rusty bolts and such. And it is not approved for human use. You can buy it as a vet using on horses for swollen joints because it is such an anti-inflammatory. It's universal solvent. So if you put it on the outside of your skin, it goes directly into your skin. And the itch you feel is going into your skin. The reason it's not approved for human use, and this may be more of a Dr. Steve uh, exact thing, than me, but I'm a physical therapist, but I've, I've been around the stuff enough to know that <clears throat> it's bad juju, man. You don't want any of it. If it, if it hooks on to a, a bacteria on the outside of your skin, which we all have bacteria on our skin, it hooks onto that bacteria and it's a solvent, meaning it goes in uh. and it hooks onto that bacteria and brings it in. That's why it's not approved for human use. And whoever told you this, run away. Run away. I mean, I'm, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure, you know, NFL football players use it and, and you know, hockey players and, and people we've got to win at all costs and get back to the game and, you know, anything in moderation. But, dude, for a, you know, a comedian trying to get his shoulder better, you got more options than right, right now, but Okay, you know what? It's helped a little bit, but uh, I'll stop using it. I'll talk to Dr. Steven. Again, I've been using it for a couple weeks. It's not like I've been using it for a year, and I just use it on my right, but I won't use it then. Uh, thank you. I appreciate all you guys calling about the DMSO. I will um, be very, very uh, careful with that, and I'll talk to Dr. Steve. Thank you very much, John, okay? Uh, okay, hang on. Uh, let's see here. Selena in Texas. Hey, Selena. Hey, Jim, big fan. Hi, how are um, you? I'm great. I'm not going to use GSMO, so I've okay. learned something. <laughs> um, I do have a quick question. Uh, we recently had a family member um, arrested for solicitation, uh, which Who was quite a scandal. Who? Um, a family member. Okay. Um, so it was quite a scandal in the family, of course, and um, I listen to the show all the time, and, and you're open and honest about that. You, you know, do that, and I don't have a problem with anyone doing that, but how do you avoid um, being, you know, arrested or picked up from from doing that? I mean, well, to be, I don't pick up girls in the street anymore, and to be honest, for the last few years, most of what I've done is just massages, many of which have just been real massages. Occasionally, they go in the other direction, but the majority have just been regular massages. Um you know, they're just real masseuses. And, uh, you know, I've been kind of doing that because it's fun to have somebody come over or to go to somebody, even though nothing's going to happen. You know what I mean? So I've mellowed a lot on that. So maybe that's one reason. But I was also ultra, ultra cautious back in those days. Like, I would never say when I pulled up to a girl, she's like, hey, what are you doing? I would be like, nothing. She'd be like, what are you looking for? I would always go, I don't know. Just to, well, why don't you get in? We'll talk about it. I was always extremely careful. And I made, because most times I would figure a police officer won't get in the car and we would ride around and talk for a minute and I would like touch their leg and get them to touch me and then say, uh, but at first I would never say it. So I was also extraordinarily careful. And when I would go to somebody's room, if I ever went to a hotel, I was again, extremely careful. I would never just hand over money and say, here's for some sex. 
<laughs> I would like, you know what I mean, be, be uh, you know, touch first or they would touch me. Like, just things a cop wouldn't do. So I would say I exercised extreme cautious and, uh, t- caution. And when I wasn't sure, I drove away or I, le- I, I just didn't do it. So I, w- I at times would pass up these experiences because of the fear of getting arrested. I was ultra careful. Yeah, because it is, you know, it's a devastating thing. It's, you know, just embarrassing because they, you know, flash it on the Internet, you know, in the town paper. And it's just like, oh, my goodness, you know, it's happening. I mean, it's the oldest profession, as they say. So it's unfortunate. It should be legal. But, you know, that's not where we are. So it's just curious. Yeah. How, what are the best means for that? So um, I would say be I care- just be your- very, very careful. That's all. All right. I appreciate your honesty. And I'll keep <clears throat> listening. Good job. Thanks, Selena. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, Scott in Boston. What's up, Scott? I, uh, I was Hi, wondering, man. I've been trying to get in shape. I've been exercising well and regularly for a while now, but I have a real problem eating late at night. And uh, I was wondering if you ever had any problems with that and what you did, if anything, because you're such a fit boy now. Well, what do you what do you do for work? I work at a restaurant. Okay, so you work crazy hours? Yeah, kind of. I usually don't eat dinner until like, you know, 10.30 or so, some fucked up hour. Well, I had one trainer tell me that if you're going to use, uh, if you're going to eat late, she said it doesn't matter, just eat carefully. Like, um, she's like, you can eat before bed, who cares, but just eat grilled chicken or something. What are you eating late at night? Just like whatever I can get my hands on. I try to, I've been trying to eat like grapes lately. I hear grapes are a good late night meal or snack, whatever. Well, how about a nice piece of grilled salmon or a piece of plain grilled chicken with some steamed vegetables? I mean, I think those are pretty good no matter when you eat them. There's times where I'll eat later than I should. Uh, yeah. But if you eat cookies in the afternoon or potato chips in the afternoon, that's not good. You know what I mean? Eating fucking really healthy late at night is a lot better than eating dog shit in the afternoon. That's true. It's usually like I'm tired and lazy, so I'll just grab like whatever is there and just stuff my face so I fall asleep. Well, that's what. Yeah, of course, that's the problem. So if you eat something and you bring home some grilled chicken or whatever and don't be lazy about it, um, that's probably the best suggestion I can give you. Yeah. Okay. Right. All right, thanks, Jimmy. Love you. All right, all right thank you, buddy. Bye-bye. Uh, Chuck in Phoenix. What's up, Chuck? Hey, uh, for, hey, for that one lady that just called about the hookers, uh, the cops that are posing as hookers cannot get in your car. So if they get in your car, that shows them that they're not a hooker. I don't know about that. I, I, You know, you hear all these weird, like, street lawyer things. You know, if a cop doesn't flash his lights at you, he can't pull you over. Like... I don't. I think I've seen them get in the car and and say pull in here and then it's a bust. I could be wrong, but I'm not 100 percent sure that's what I, I did. I've never seen them get in the car. I've never had one get in the car with me. That's for safety issues, dude. That's not because they're not legally allowed. That might be for their own safety. Now, I, again, I don't know. Oh, you okay. might be right, but that could just be because they don't want to get in the car with you in case you have a pistol or a knife, then they're not protected. Yeah. Okay, I'll see you January 23rd at Talking Stick Casino in Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm very much looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. But you see now Chuck gave us a call. Thank you, Chuck. And he didn't know 100%. So now if I take that street guy lawyer advice, hey, hey, and then the girl gets to the car, and I'm like, how much for head? And she throws the cuffs on me. So always, uh, always check it out. Make sure you know what you're talking about. Hello, Bill in Boston has a testosterone comment. Hey, Jim. Hi, buddy. Hey, you've helped me out uh, in the past, but um, <clears throat> with my heroin addiction. Uh, oh, good, buddy. Yeah, I'm doing good. Um, but I have uh, every every three months. I'm 48 years old. I work in a very uh, harsh field of stone mason. Um, but uh, every three months, I have uh, testosterone placed in, into my uh, hip. Why? And uh, because uh, about fucking stupid story. Seven, eight years ago, I lost all my hair on my body. Right, I look like fucking baby new year for Christ's sake. Um, and they, they realized that I had no testosterone in my body. They had no idea why, uh, still don't know to this day. So I started taking testosterone, the shots that Joe does and the rub that puts that you put on your body and it just wasn't doing it. Um, so this really sexy doctor in, in, in Boston, um, is the, is head of this fucking oncology place. And it's, it's unbelievable. And she's so hot. And, uh, every, Three months, yeah. Every three months, she she uh, cuts my leg and 
and stuff these little things in my hip that are actual look like Uncle Ben's rice. Oh, and, wow. uh, and and she puts twelve of them in my hip and they and they uh dissolve and you feel I feel like I'm eighteen. Okay. My wife can't stand it sometimes because I, uh, uh, all I do is get hard ons, you know. Um but it really helps. It, it, it's an amazing it's an amazing thing. Um if you're feeling down or if anybody's feeling like low <clears throat> It really helps you. Well, let me ask you now. Uh, it does help you, but does it make you dependent on it? That's the question. Uh, you know what? I I have been a drug addict, so I know the feelings of dependency, you know, and it, it does. It really does because I have gone four and a half months without uh, getting the implants in, and I felt like dog shit. My um, testosterone dove, and uh, I don't know what I was down to. They said uh, a little below 100, which is supposed to be 300 to 700, right around there, you know, anywhere in between there. Okay. And, uh, and, and it dove, and I felt like dog shit. So I'm a person that needs it all the time. Um, I don't know about the shots. And uh, it was really dangerous, though. The, the stuff that I rubbed on, the, the rub that I, supposed to, that I put on my shoulders, uh, before I had this, the uh, little implants put in, uh, my my wife couldn't touch it. My son couldn't touch it. He was young. They couldn't even get near it. Wow. Uh, it, it was like six years ago, and uh, they were saying, you know, it would it would spike his. He was he was like nine at the time, and uh, it would they would say give him a bunch of testosterone, and then when he gets older, he would he wouldn't have any. You know, like his his ball sack would be tiny. He wouldn't have any testosterone released in his body. Oh, okay. uh, you know, so it's really really iffy. You know, but you don't have any kids that you know of, and uh, no, I have none. And you don't have any living with you, so. But you All know, right. just something to look into. It's pretty cool. Thanks, pal. Appreciate. It. Take care, uh, Stephen in New York. What's up, Stephen? <clears throat> hey. Hi. Um, what do you think is the right age to lose your virginity? Depends on the person, and you know what your maturity level is. I guess there's no right age as long as you're not underage. You know, you don't want to be 14. I would say 17, 18 seems okay. But if you're a little older, that's fine. How old a guy are you? 15. Yeah, I mean, look, dude, it's not going to kill you if you do. But, you know, there's no need to not wait a little bit. This way, you know, you'll be a bit more responsible. I think the older you get, the more likely you are to think it through and make the decision for kind of the right reason. Um, you know, you don't want to just do it just to stick it in somewhere because that's how girls get pregnant. <laughs> You know, so, yeah, wait a couple of years, dude. Just All jerk right. off for now. <laughs> All right? All right. Bye, buddy. Right. Uh, let's see. Chad in Ohio. What's going on? Hello? Oh, Chad dropped. Um, okay, let's see here. Uh, um, Mike in California. What's up, buddy? Hey, buddy. Hey, man. Hey, uh, so I, I just, uh, you recently helped me with uh, some addictive issues, and, and I got clean. I've been clean for, for seven and a half months now, and um, I just wanted to thank you for all the help you gave me. Uh, oh, on good. This I'm thing. glad, man. I appreciate it. And, you know, it's not often, I, I don't have anything really to bitch about, or, you know, like everything's going great, and, and you gave me great advice, so I appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. It's really nice to hear, man. I uh, Keep it up. I'm really happy to hear that. Yeah, and hey, Jimmy, real quick, uh, the guy that was calling, just to help any listeners out, the guy that was calling in Massachusetts about the testosterone, I know you're probably over the testosterone right now, but um, to answer your question, yes, your body does become dependent on it, and you won't produce it on your own once you're taking the supplement. And the reason why that guy tested low and any opiate addict uh, during their addiction will test low on testosterone because the opiates will mask out the testosterone. Oh, so okay. it's if if you if he was an addict and he did his, and he was lost his testosterone, that's his reason why. Okay, thanks anyways, very much. Good thanks, call, man. Thanks Appreciate again, it. man. Thanks. Thank you. See, if I don't know it, the listeners do. That's the beauty of this show. I know very little. <clears throat> Chad in Ohio is back. What's up, Chad? Hey guys, just, just hey. a quick question for you, buddy. Um, two days ago, you had uh, or you guys were bringing in uh, all the guy from Dumb and Dumber, uh, Jeff Daniels. All the I can't remember his name now, but right before that, there was some dude in the studio that was kind of sit back and hope he brought him up and he said, what are you here for? And he did some 
dumb rape joke. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, but I couldn't understand. I was because I was trying to watch it on your guys' cha- YouTube channel, or whatever, and I couldn't understand what he was there for or what. Oh, what. I'll t- I'll tell you. He was a guy, and he you know he was a guy who was uh, I guess he's a fan of the show, and I think he had donated to the Patrice documentary. So once in a while. We'll do these things where if you donate some like money to a, a cause or the Patrice thing or whatever it is, one of the things you get is the ability to sit in studio and watch us do the show. And, uh, you know, if you, some merchandise or whatever, it's just like a perk you get. So I guess he had done that and he was in for the day. So I'll always say hi to somebody. And Opie said hi to him. And I was surprised that he was coming up to the mic to sit. Because normally, if you talk to somebody for a minute, they'll just go, hey, blah, blah, here. But we had Jeff Daniels about to come in. So he just, guy just sat down and did a rape joke, which we, I think we were all just a little bit surprised because uh, more we had Jeff coming in. But, um, you know, he was there. I think he was there because he had helped out with Patrice's documentary. Okay. Yeah, your, your face, because you took like a drink to your Starbucks or whatever. And then you like finally caught on to what she was saying. And then like you did the thumbs up. I, I was at work and I was watching and I just started laughing. Well, what, I'll tell you what I was thumbs upping was the fact that it totally bombed and it was like, okay, like, you know, like, and it was, it was more like just, cause I didn't know what he was going to say. Like, cause we weren't supposed to interview him. So when he just walked up to the mic, it's very, very rare for an in-studio guest, like to, in that capacity to, to, to walk to the mic and sit down. So when he goes, I got busted on sexual assault. It just took me a second. Like, what the fuck is he talking about? Like, and then I just kind of made me. What made me laugh was the monumental bomb, yeah, uh, which yeah. I thought was very funny. But uh, you know, he's a good egg. He tried. He helped us out, and he just took a swing and he missed, and it happens. <laughs> right on. I'll let you go, Jimmy. Thanks for thanks for uh, taking my call, and I love your show, man. All right, buddy. Thanks. Hi, Tim in Detroit. What's up? I recently uh, had a threesome with my wife and another woman uh, that was uh, alcohol and marijuana fueled, okay. and. Uh, we had uh, discussed it, you know, in the earlier, and she said, "Well, if I have a threesome, then you got to have a threesome with another guy." And I ain't having it, Jimmy. How do you, what do I do? How, how do I? Uh, how do I tell this to my wife? Wait, so you did it under the guise that you would have this other threesome, but now you're changing your mind? Um, well, to tell you the truth, I never really agreed to it. I told her it wasn't going to happen, and this was kind of like I said, alcohol and right. uh, weed fueled. But now she expects me to follow through, and you know I ain't doing it. Um, well, then I guess you got to tell her. I mean, I think her disappointment at you not doing it won't be as detrimental to the marriage of you not being able to unsee her being fucked by another guy. Like, you know what I mean? Like, if you if you're both not totally down with it, you shouldn't do it. So that's probably a great move to not do it. So, any uh, any comments or suggestions on how I how I break it to her? Just be honest. Look, you know, look, I love you. I have good sex with you, but I'm just too jealous to allow that to happen. And we did this and I wasn't trying to be a dick. It was just we were both really drunk and I wasn't trying to be deceitful. We don't have to do it again, you know, but just tell her that it's just going to be too hard for you. Um, because once you see that, you can't, like I said, you cannot unsee it. So make a hundred percent sure that that's what you want before you do it, you know? Great show, guys. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Jackie in Philly. Hi, Jackie. I mean, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Um, I'm good. Um, I have been sober for sober and clean for about a year. Oh, great. And I am thinking about dating, but I've I've been using and drinking like for about ten years. So I've I don't, I've never dated sober. Right. So one, I'm kind of nervous about that, and. Two, I don't know, like, when do you mention it to someone? Because they usually go out for drinks for a date. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know how to bring that up. You know, you can do something like, um, you know, after a year, I think you're fine to do a little bit of dating. I mean, you know, you've gotten mm-hmm. some of the mess cleaned up. And, you know, when, when they ask me, do you drink? I just go, no, I don't drink. And a lot of times, uh, I'll just go like, no, nah, I'm allergic to it, or it makes me sick. Oh, Okay. Mm-hmm. Or if they go, how come you don't drink? Did you used to? I'll go, uh, yes, I used to a lot. And uh, I was very naughty when I drank. And I was, an after, I, was, I was an embarrassing after school special. So it's better. You know, and I try to make it light. I don't go like, yes, yeah, sit down. Right. We have to talk. You know, I never <laughs> do it like that. My rehab. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what I mean? I, I make light of it in, in the sense that it's a serious thing for me. But I don't yeah. overly dr- dramatize it when I'm out to dinner with someone. 
Right. Because to me, it's fine that I don't drink. I'm fine if you do. And it's just a part of my life that I don't do. Like, it's something I don't do. I don't look at it like I am being robbed of drinking in my devastating experience. You know, I never right. make it like that. So I think mm-hmm. people are relaxed with it because I'm relaxed with it. And if they're like, you sure? Yes, no, no, I'm sure. I cannot be peer pressured into drinking. I cannot be peer pressured into it. And um, anyone that would try to peer pressure me into it, um, I would wind up just being rude to. But it's really never happened, so... You, mm. you'll, have a, you'll have people don't usually give a fuck to be honest now it might be different because you're a woman and a guy is more yeah. likely to want a woman to drink than a woman is going to want a guy to drink but yeah. um, just be uh, you know hey no nah, I don't and if they ask you why say I used to I just stopped you know yeah it was a problem you know it wasn't mm. fun so life is better without it keep it simple that's all okay all right all right thank you or else here's what you do you lie say yes i used to drink and smother infants what no i'm just kidding and then anything you say will be light after that so you make you make a joke about doing something horrible and then Uh when they realize they're so relieved that you're not a baby killer that anything else you admit to doing is going to seem fun and and good natured okay so like when i drank i used to rape men and rescue them well, no guy is going to be discouraged by that. No, you don't want to do that. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's that. You don't want to say that. Oh God, I don't drink. It would just make me suck dick, real sloppy and wet. Like that's not a deterrent to a man. Um, that's right. You know, you, you know what you could say? I used to drink a lot, but whenever I did, I would give really toothy blowjobs and finger a guy's ass until it bled. And he'll go, "Oh, thank God, you don't drink anymore." <laughs> okay. Please don't drink. Yeah, please don't. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Jerry. All right. Goodbye. Uh, <clears throat> let's see here, uh, Alex in Virginia. Hey, man. Hey, Jimmy. How are you today? You said, yeah, I'm good, but I used to sleep with a lady who's going to babysit for you. <laughs> well, um, she's not our normal babysitter. Our normal babysitter has plans tomorrow. You know, and first of all, I don't cheat on my wife. I never have. I never intend to. <laughs> so it, it's just a weird circumstance, and I feel really nervous about it. I don't know if I should just ignore it completely and pretend I don't know this chick. Uh, how, how did she come to? Should... How many years ago did you sleep with her? And how did she come to babysit the kid? Um, it was like six years ago, before I even knew my wife. Okay. Um, it, it, she uh, ended up getting married, and then I guess she's recently been divorced. Uh, She's just looking for some extra cash. My wife found her via a mutual friend because she babysits their kids. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't don't know. Let me me say this. I mean, obviously you're not doing anything wrong, but do you really need that possible headache? Like, your wife might go, why the fuck is she in my house? You, you fought, like, how would you feel if it was just some guy your wife fucked going to babysit the kids? Um, you know, maybe I'm a little more liberal, but I, I'm pretty confident in our relationship, and okay. it really wouldn't bother me that much. I mean, sure, it would be a conversation, but man, I'm not the type to explode on something well, like that. why don't that. you ask your wife what she thinks? Why don't you just ask her? You know, sit her down and just, you know, pinch her nip a little bit. Go, hey, babe, I got to talk to you. You know, straight yeah. around, show who the man is. But ask her, yeah. like, legitimately, what do you think? She might go, fuck that, or she might go, I don't care. But, you know, why not ask her? This way you, you at least give yourself plausible, not deniability, but at least you were honest about it, and your wife won't give you any malarkey. I, I'm not a fan of malarkey. <laughs> uh, yes, I All am right. not either. That, that's, a good, that's good advice. Thanks, Jim. All right, take care. Uh, <clears throat> let's see here. Um, Dave in New York. What's up, Dave? <clears throat> um, uh, the problem I'm having right now is uh, I genuinely want to get sober. Okay. And uh, I experienced two ro- uh, two years in the rooms. Okay. And it doesn't quite work for me because I'm a little more atheistic than other people. Mm-hmm. And I understand, you know, the chapter to the agnostics and everything, but that really doesn't apply to me. And, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. And I'm not okay. saying that any... Let me ask you a question. Now, I'm not trying to sell you on a 12-step program. Whatever you do to get sober, good for you. But what do you mean it's, it doesn't apply to you? Um, well, you know, with the 12-step program, I find, it, I, I find it to be more religiously orientated. And whereas I am kind of... I'm not anti-religion. I'm just, you know, sure. just a non-believer. Well, well I, I, every I can, I, that's fair, Dave, and, and you can believe in no deity at all. Um, 
I'm not, and again, whatever your belief is is cool, but I, whatever we say, like, well, that, that's not, that doesn't fit me. I'm always careful of that because, I mean, yeah, everyone's kind of different, but chronic uniqueness is bad for us because as alcoholics, <laughs> you know what I mean? We're all very yeah, similar I, 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 people, I, I, man. I'm following. We're all very similar people. And I have had my faith since I've been sober change a lot. And I've lost a lot of it. And a lot of it is just me, my self-will and me being an asshole. And some of it is like the more I look about black holes and science and deep space and, and fucking, you know, I, I, I try to understand theoretical physics, which I hardly do at all. But the more I look at this scientific shit, the harder it is for me to believe that some creator made it and is listening to fat-titted Jimmy complain uh, that no girl likes him. So I've struggled with that a lot. But I, I think that you can be an ardent atheist or a hardcore non-believer and it's still get sober. In a let, me, let me just say one last thing before I go, Norton. Sure. Um, I uh, I celebrate. You know, I did two years in the rooms. I went to a sponsor and went through the steps and everything. And uh, I'm deeply embarrassed because I falsely celebrated a year sober. Okay. And everyone in the room knew I wasn't sober for a year, but I was up there, you know, giving, you know, telling my my hardships and everything. And uh, I feel like I can't go back to the rooms because they're in my neighborhood, and like everyone knows that I lied. And well, I, hold I on, Jerry, Dave, let, Dave, let me tell you something, and I, and I know what you're saying is important. Nobody would hold it against you if you came back. It's one of those things that like, okay, yeah, it's embarrassing. So what's more embarrassing, that or fucking drunk driving into an eight-year-old? Like, okay, I fucked up, but you're saying that program or this place didn't work for me when the reality is... You probably didn't do everything you were supposed to do, and I can't think of any form of treatment, whether it's a therapist or religious or 12 steps or a cold turkey, where lying is a great part of recovery. So I don't think any place you go, hey, I'm lying about how long I've been sober and I'm, I'm still a liar is going to be okay. So it's okay to admit, hey, man, I fucked up. I was dumb. I, my own, I did it the way I wanted to, and I didn't do it the way I was recommended, and I fucked up. And instead of dealing with the shame of fucking up and realizing, man, that's going to help somebody else someday, you understand someday people are going to laugh at that. Like, you ever hear people in the, in the rooms laugh when someone think, says something horrible? Yeah, I, I fucking drunk drove, and I fucking hit a goddamn telephone pole, and, you know, we laugh at that shit because we understand the craziness. So don't be embarrassed or be embarrassed and go back anyway and give it another shot while you're alternately looking for another treatment place. You don't have to stay there forever, okay? You don't have to marry yourself to 12 steps. But at least go there where you know people and begin talking fucking honestly, maybe for the first nice. time. Thank you. Thank okay? you. Nice. Uh, I think you said what I kind of needed to hear. You know, yeah. You, you kind of kicked me into the right direction. Uh, fucking Norton, man. Thank you. All right, good luck, buddy, and uh, you know, just just make sure you try to do something because there's there's nothing good to be found when we're out there, and you know that, okay? Thanks, Jimmy. All right, good luck, Dave. Take care, buddy. Uh, let's see here. Um, I don't know about this one, Jamie in Philly. Hey, Jamie. Um, Steve Spencer, Dwight, I appreciate the feedback with us. I just found out I'm the youngest of three boys, all you know, all American family, mother, father, three kids. My, my oldest brother is 42. At the end of the summer, my uh, my aunt accidentally clipped me and said something like, only your brother knew how hard your father fought to keep custody of him. Wow. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? So I pulled my mom and dad, put them down, I'm like, all right, we've got to talk about this. And uh, my mother and father admitted that my dad was married well before you know, I was even thought. Uh, back when my brother was born, you know, 1973, uh, they had him, and then things didn't work out with his wife, and he met my mother, you know, my his brother was like two years old at the time. They talked to a psychologist. The, the psychologist back in the early 70s said, don't tell him if you're going to start a family to my mother and father. You know, you're going to have four kids. Don't tell him. He'll feel like an outcast. Just raise him like he's yours. So wait, so the uh, mother, your, your mom is not his biological mom, but he thinks I, she is. Yes. Yes. And my and mom's you, been living this life for my father for the last 42 years. And you want to know if you should tell him. Now, I don't know. I've never been through that. But I would say this, the advantage to him knowing is for medical reasons, what if there's something in his biological mom's 
fucking medical history that he should know about. Like, what if there's a bunch of male breast cancer or whatever it is? She, he should have access to those records medically. Uh, I think that's unfair. And your parents are probably not thinking of that. Like, your mom is, they're probably not trying to be dicks, but they're probably just not thinking of that. Well, my mother said, like, I think you should know, but I'm not the one that's walking in that got married and had a kid, you know, and, and divorced. But that's your father's responsibility. My mom's like, who is my dad? My dad's just a cold, like, uh, non confrontational. No, I'm not doing it. Not I'm not saying anything. Well, he's like, he paid it 42 years, and he's, got, you know, he's content with, you know, living that life. Well, why don't yeah. you mention to him, that um the medical angle like yeah. maybe he hasn't thought of that but say you know there might be something in her history which mom doesn't have in her history that could fuck him up and he would never see it coming um yeah. I, I think you should try it from that angle because you know non-confrontational or not i think your brother has the right to know at 42 years old that there may be something he needs to look up or there may be something uh you know he should have the right to know who his mom is i think if, if no other reason than for that Oh, he, uh, we lost him. Lou is telling, Lou whispers in my ear sometimes in what is a very sexy radio voice. But he's telling me that we lost the caller. We did not hang up on you. So thank you for calling. And, um, you know, that's what I would suggest. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Earl in Ohio. What's up, Earl? Yeah, Jim. Um, um, me and my, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, me and my wife, more her than me because I'm not really into it. But we've been swinging thing for a while. You've been swinging? And, yeah, we were swinging. And then he got out of it, and she got back into it. Where now which I allowed her, I guess you can call me a couple, but I allowed her, you know, certain guys. And she was never wanting to hook up with a black guy. Well, now she tells me she does, and she's got one set up for this Friday. How do you feel about it? I don't quite get why one minute she's adamant about them saying no, no, I don't want to, when it was just joking around when it was brought up, to the next minute wanting to. Here's why, here's why she might be like that, and it's probably the reason I'm like that with different stuff sexually. Because it seems like with, with this age of everything being at your fingertips, you can see everything. It's almost like, so it, it keeps getting harder to top what I did last week. It keeps getting harder to do what I did yesterday. So we keep topping it and changing it because we want it to seem fresh and new and exciting. So I used to never watch interracial porn. It just didn't, didn't offend me, but it didn't do anything for me because a black dick isn't my dick, so I can't relate to the dick in the porn. And then all of a sudden I saw, I saw one video... And I still don't watch interracial porn that's just professionals. But a, an amateur video of a black guy fucking a white woman, if I can see the husband in the video filming, like if I know he's watching it, the taboo mm -hmm. nature of the dirtiness of it turned me on, and then I can watch that. So all of a sudden, now it's switched, and now I like that. So it's like... By looking at all this shit, a lot of times we continue to need to morph and change so it stays interesting and exciting. If you're not 100% sure that you're down with it, tell her, I don't want us to do this. You got to both be fucking down with it because, again, if she's not even sure she wants to do it. So you know what you do? Like what I suggested well, earlier. How about this? Take out an ad on, on Craigslist anonymously. And put up a fake email address that you can access, you know, fucking husband and wife, black dick at Gmail, whatever it is. Have mm -hmm. people send you, black guys send you pictures of their dicks or their bodies and what they want to do. You and your wife look at that together and you can fuck her or you can go down on her or you can even star six, seven, block your number and call these guys and talk to them while you fuck her. See how you feel about that. So you put your foot in the water, put your foot in the water without actually doing something. Because if you go, oh, my God, I hate that. That hurts. Then you haven't really done anything. Yeah, there's, well, there's trust issues because with me and her on the fact that she went to a place with a friend of hers, which is another female. And she come back two hours later, all hot and bothered up about it. And I found out they were making out in a car. Yeah, just because it's a girl doesn't mean she should be, cool, be doing it. Which would, which would be cool, you know what I mean, if I was there, but just to be doing it and then come home and tell me about it. Yeah. That's what I'm how, how, did did she think about. it would, did she know it was deceitful or did she think that you'd love it? No, she knew, she thought I'd love it, but it wasn't, the, she got it once before with a guy, um, a friend of mine. 
she made out with him and then lied about it. That's kind of shit. I found out from his wife like six months later. And why? And so, what did she? Are you sure she's never fucked anyone and not told you? Um, I do not know. I have like suspicions. She says she hasn't. Um, so, do you like the cuckolding angle of your sexual life? Oh yeah, yeah. We we were drinking one night and come home and there was a guy on the site that she talks to that lives maybe twenty minutes down the road. And all they've done is they ever talked. And I was drunk, she was drunk, and I got on the phone, and got his, or got his number off of, of one of her emails, and called him up and had him come over that night. Okay, and how was it? Videoed and all that. Oh, I, I liked it. Don't get me. I mean, I, I definitely liked it. It's just I don't know how one minute she's no, 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 no. I don't want to do this, and now wanting to, unless she's doing it. Because she thinks I want her to, and we had the big fight about her making out with her friend. Um, all right, well, then don't do it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. If you're both so hesitant, it's not worth doing. I got to run, buddy, because we got a few more calls, but I think that's cool, all right? Hello? Oh, he hung up. Okay. All right, buddy. Uh, let's see here. Steve in Seattle lost a lot of weight. Hey, buddy. Um, yeah, dude, I, I've lost about 120 pounds. Oh, great, man. And, uh, I, and I am a new person, um, mentally, spiritually, physically, all over the board. I used to weigh 360 pounds. Um, I'm about 250 right now. That's awesome. Pounds. Good for you. Are you still working on losing the weight? What? Come again? Are you still losing weight? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I gotta, great. I gotta, I'm trying to I'm trying to get to the same size as my favorite NFL player uh, here in Seattle. So uh, uh, hopefully uh, I can maybe uh, do some kind of uh, inspiration for my team here. So uh, well, I hope he's not a fucking place kicker because then you got a long way to go. <laughs> <laughs> now, but here's the problem. Here's an issue that I uh, I've been running into, and that is having lost this weight. Uh, I'm a pretty good looking guy. I always have been very jovial with my friends hey he's the funny guy you know he's he's but being heavy you know inside you felt terrible now now i feel great and and here's the problem i'm married and i get too much attention like i i can walk anywhere i'm i'm six foot three and 250 pounds have robert plant's hair and i'm like like two chicks dig it i just go in they love my hair i was out on my birthday told my friend that i said look i'm gonna go find the hottest girl i can and see if she'll buy me a drink just start talking it, it's like it, it, i can't turn it off now so it's, and kind of, it's kind of the flirting is very tempting because now girls are more interested in you but you love oh, your wife right oh my wife is great everything is great except uh she she's a total workaholic and zero drive Zero drive whatsoever. Well, maybe she'll it, have more drive now that you've lost the weight. Is she, is she heavy? Uh, a little bit, not too bad. And she's uh, on, uh, getting healthier too. But um, you know, uh, in the beginning of our relationship, uh, we lost, like in the first six months of first year with her, uh, her mom uh, passed away, and then later her dad uh, with with Alzheimer's. And so it just it's like we've been through the ringer uh, in the first part of our marriage, you know. And so what's happened is that. It's almost like it's turned off for her. And I know she's like, I know you're going to be out. You travel. I do. You know, I just be respectful. And the thing is, I don't want to because you know, there's been a couple of times where it's, it's a, you know, I've gotten there and like one night stands and it's just, you know, unless I'm into the person, it's just like, man, I, here we are. We've been, you know, had a couple of drinks. We're naked. And it's only happened like two times. And I, I just, I, I wasn't feeling it. I don't, you know, it's not like I'm. Right. You know, you know what I mean? Let me say this, Steve. I, I got to run because I only got two minutes yeah. up. But I would say my suggestion would be this. Your wife was fucking you when you were fat. She stayed with you. You don't want to go out and just cheat on her now. No, Maybe no, try to work things out with her. I mean, it's fun to get a little attention. There's nothing wrong with flirting. Um, but, I, but you know, I, that's my, my suggestion, especially if she was with you and you were really heavy, you know? Yeah, yeah. I got to run, buddy. We only got two minutes left. Yeah. Bye. Congrats on the weight loss. That's great, though. Hey, hey but, uh, hit that other caller up a couple of weeks ago. Tell him, man. He'll be listening. Keep up the work, brother. All right, buddy. Thank you very much. Um, let's see here. Uh, Kurt in South Carolina. What's up, man? Hey, Jim. Uh, I called a couple weeks ago, and I mentioned that I was just looking at my 100 days of sobriety. Oh, great. Take, yeah, you weren't able to take my calls to call back, so I am. And 
I kind of like reflected a great deal on on uh, the boredom factor of, of not drinking and really trying to just you know be a normal human being and productive and so on and so forth. But you know, I continue going to the AA meetings. I go you know, two three times a week as much as I can. It doesn't take away from my family. But at this point, I think I'm getting really sick and tired of talking about alcohol. And I hate to sound narcissistic or basically a bad person, but you know, I look around the room that I'm in. And I see all these people, I hear their stories, and I'm apathetic towards them, but I can't get over the thoughts. Like, in real life, outside of that room, I would never, ever hang out or socialize, nor would they with me. We're just not the same people. And I'm so, I'm so over talking about alcohol. I'm looking for that next chapter, and I don't know if it's serving my, my purpose by going to these meetings and constantly hearing these stories about how hammered somebody got or how they fell off the wagon, but they're back now. It's just like it keeps on picking at that scab, and I'm almost becoming uh, uh, against talking about it. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I think part of it, and I have to wrap very soon. I apologize. Um, part of it is this, dude. I, I don't think the problem, because there's always any, any group you go to, uh, whether it's a or a non-12-step program, whatever you decide to do, I don't think what they're talking about is the issue. I think the issue is, like you said, I, I feel different from them. I don't feel like I connect with them. We're not the same. Even though the beautiful thing is underneath everything, you're exactly the same. Like socially, you may be different, intelligence-wise, whatever, but underneath, it affects you the way it affects them. To me, that's that's the part of it that helped me a lot, dude. I got sober when I was fucking 18. Uh, you think I related to people in their 50s and 60s lifestyle-wise? I was fucking terrified. I had zero self-esteem. I had, I had no life skills. Um, I didn't relate to a lot of people. Sometimes the only thing I related to, it's not even the booze, dude. You know, you, you and I could talk. I quit when I was 18. You probably drank a shitload more booze than I did. But I can absolutely relate to the way it made you feel. And I don't mean drunk. I mean the regret or the things that we do or the lack of control we have um, or the abusive relationships we get into or the way, you know what I mean? The, 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 the fucking things that make me who I am or the things that make you who you are, that's the shit I relate to. Uh, the war stories are the war stories. They're irrelevant, you know, because, you know, you talk to a guy who's doing life in prison because he killed somebody and he can't remember it. You know, that's what happens out there, too. I'll never be able to relate to that, that type of thing. But, you know, you, you, you know, they say identify, don't compare. You know, I'm not going to relate to everything a fucking person says. So I take the things that they say that I actually can relate to um, and the things I can't, that's okay, too, you know? All right, man. Thank you. Uh, but, uh, but again, uh, my only suggestion is if, if it's having a hard time, whatever the group is, search for other ones. You don't have to stay in the same fucking building. Go to another place. Find some other people. But don't give up and just go back to drinking just yet. Give yourself a little bit more time, all right? All right. Thanks again, Jim. Okay. Good luck, Gene. Guys, I got to go. So I apologize to those of you who are still on hold. I'm going to Anthony Cumia's right now in the rain to do his show. So uh, if you want to hear me on Anthony, go to anthonycumia.com. If not, then don't. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to The Jim Norton Show. Hear all that advice whenever you want to on demand at SiriusXM.com slash on demand. On Sirius XM is real.